Doctors of Reddit, what is your how the hell are you even alive right now story? I am a doctor. My moments to shine. Patient was driving a motorbike. We were informed that dispatch had been sent to pick up a motorbike versus logging truck. Bike was behind the truck which had lost its load of logs at highway speeds. Trauma team is activated. We have called for blood. Guy walked out of the ER after period of observation. When he saw the logging truck lose its load. He simply let go of his bike and fell at the back. Rolled a bit and got some bumps and bruises. But fine. Second case off the top of my head was a 92 year old lady with urosepsis, bacterial infection in her blood from a urinary tract infection. Her initial gas had a pH of around 6. 7. And a lactate of 12. Too acidic and too high for the non-medical peeps. Young patients would have a hard time surviving that let alone the very elderly. She was unconscious. But had received one dose of Cipro, an antibiotic, by mouth from her family doctor before becoming altered. Family agreed to a comfort, do not resuscitate, level of care and said their goodbyes. The next morning. The resident on call got pages asking if Mrs. Blah 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 could eat, she was awake and hungry. Guess the dose of Cipro kicked in. Obligatory not doctor disclaimer. About a year and a half ago. A friend of mine was going mountain biking. He wasn't actually on the mountain yet. Just riding his bike over to a friend's house. They were going up on the mountain together. He stopped to tie his shoe and, for some reason, took off his helmet. Finished tying his shoe. Pedaled 10 feet. And got hit by a car. Someone. We suspect it was the driver. Called in an anonymous tip to the hospital. They found my friend with a broken skull on the side of the road. Hospitalized him. Then discovered that he had a bleed in the membrane between his skull and brain. It was pushing on brain tissue. I believe it was something like a 20% chance of survival. The trauma team drained his skull. Stapled it back together. Sewed his head up. And two days later he woke up extremely concussed and confused. But otherwise fine. Scared the hell out of us and his family. But all is well except he occasionally feels the weather and gets a few more headaches than usual. Bright side to all of this is that he found his calling once he was back in the workforce. He immediately became a paramedic. And is currently getting his certification to work as a fire rescue paramedic. Now he saves other people's lives. Full circle. Second hand story from my dad. A paramedic. Comma we got a call for an elderly patient with severe burns. What we figured out later was that they had fought their clothes on fire cooking something. And run around their kitchen setting everything else on fire and not putting themselves out. We get there and put them on a stretcher. Because that's procedure. But we're all certain they're dead. The whole body is black. They're not moving. Etc. So we're talking to each other as we wheel the stretcher out. Saying things like how this guy do this to himself. And this dude's really fucked up. And then what's left of the eyelids flicker and the patient rasps I'm a lady. The guys near the stretcher ship themselves and everybody else tried to stop laughing. She died at the hospital. Whenever my dad tells this story me. Him. And any co-workers around start laughing. And everyone else is kind of shocked that he'd tell the story. Not a doctor. But a police officer. About 12 years ago I was working in the NYPD. In the Bronx. We got a call of a fight in progress in hallway of an apartment building. When we get up the stairs there is a young man laying on the floor in more blood than I thought was even inside the human body. The blood covered the entire landing. Almost pouring down the stairs. A rival drug dealer stabbed him 7 times in his stomach and chest with a 6 inch steak knife. I thought he was dead for sure. Two years later I walk into the cell block and there he is sitting on the bench. Behind the bars. He was arrested for selling drugs in a schoolyard. My actual question to him was how the fuck are you still alive? Double quote. My dad was a doctor and. After getting out of the army air force in world war 2 and completing his residency. He worked briefly in New York City. He was called to someone's house for an emergency and when he got there. Discovered it was a 5 story walk up. He trudged upstairs wearing his suit and heavy overcoat. 
carrying his not too light doctor's bag. After knocking on the door, he was greeted by a young woman who led him into the rear bedroom. There lying in the bed was a perfectly healthy young boy of about 7. The mother said to the boy, I told you if you didn't get up and clean your room, I was going to call the doctor to give you a shot. Double quote. It was amazing that this woman was still alive after my father left. True story. A woman lost control of her car and slammed into a house. The house had a wooden deck and a splinter which was really a giant sharp chunk of wood. About 4 inches in diameter. Smashed through her nose below her eyes and stopped a few millimeters in front of her brain. I was called to the ED to intubate the patient. I realized quickly after arriving in the trauma bay that the woman was not only alive, but also completely conscious and could hear everything going on around her. Fortunately the intubation was really easy. And she went to the oar and survived. I don't know how the reconstructive surgery went. And I haven't heard anything about her in months. But that image of a woman lying in the trauma bay with a giant chunk of wood coming out of the middle of her face will never be erased from my mind. Not a doctor, of course. But I worked with a guy who was at the hospital getting x-rays or an MRI done, not sure which, on his upper body. Partway through the imaging. The doctor starts freaking out and tells him to lie completely still and not to move his head. Turns out his skull isn't attached to his neck by bone or cartilage. Which he and the doctor didn't know about until the imaging. He wasn't even getting checked out for neck pain. He was getting his rotator cuff checked. Turns out the problem was that about 20 years earlier he was in a car accident which led to the injury. Apparently because he worked out extensively it didn't cause him any issues. Also it was explained to me that way. Once they realized that he was fine. They just advised him not to ride any roller coasters or stuff like that. And the doctor who found it wrote a medical paper about it. My details may be off. It's been a few years since I worked with the guy and was told the story. Not a doctor. But a guy I work with was traveling up a mountain to get to a job site with a team of about 6 people in total and they had a heavy rain the night before causing a few rock slides but nothing too major that would cause them to think they shouldn't work. So they took their 3 trucks up the trails and came across 2 boulders blocking their path and they got out to try to see if they could somehow drive around. When another boulder suddenly slid down and pinned him in between the one he was standing by. My brother was standing 6 feet from him and said the sound was horrifying and he was sure he was dead. Even though the rock was roughly the size of a sedan it only hit his lower half and long story short. It was a long road to recovery but the only broken bones he has was a shattered pelvis and now he has a colostomy bag from it rupturing his colon. There may have been other stuff but I can't quite remember specifics other than he was touch and go in IQ for a month or so. But yeah. All the docs agreed he shouldn't have survived. He's doing well now though. A few years ago. A 5 year old boy was brought to the emergency department. To us. He was dead. He wasn't breathing and had no pulse. As per protocol. Attempt was made to resuscitate him. After 10 minutes. He had a very weak pulse so we shifted him to the IQ and put him on the ventilator. We didn't expect him to survive the night. Over the next 3 days, his pulse became stronger but he didn't breathe. After 2 more days, he started making some breathing effort. After a week of admission, the boy was taken off the ventilator and breathing independently. 2 days after that, he was running around the ward, eager to go home and this was the child who seemed to be dead on arrival. Nurse here we had a guy walk into the ER he had neck pain after diving into a shallow pool. After having an x-ray and waiting 4 hours he decided to get up and leave as the pain wasn't worth the wait. As he walks out the attending yells for someone to stop him and immobilize his head. Turns out his C4 was cracked and rubbing close to the spinial cord one wrong twist he would have been paralyzed. Not to mention he also had a small brain bleed which was only noted after the CT scan before the surgery. My grandmother suffered a stroke in the middle of the night when she was getting out of bed. She was a widow. And it unfortunately coincided with the exact time that my parents was on a vacation. We found her on the bedroom floor 5 days later. We knew the period of time that had passed because of the number of uncollected newspapers and mailbox. Still alive. 
When we told the paramedics and later the doctors at the hospital that she had spent five days on that floor without any water or food they looked pretty unconvinced. The thing was that she had always suffered from water retention in her legs. And in the years preceding the stroke it had actually gotten worse. Seems like the body subsisted on that fluid. And that was why she did not literally die of thirst. She went into training and except for one of her hands being numb. She made an almost full recovery and only died two years later of unrelated issues, lung infection. She was a habitual smoker. My mother is a physician. And she was describing something that happened to me a few months ago, for background she does palliative care. Basically they had this patient. He's in a coma. No cognitive functions. For all intents and purposes he's out. The guy suffers renal failure. So the family puts him on dialysis to keep him alive. Well. He's also having circulatory issues. As he's on a vent. So he's starting to lose blood flow to his appendages. Which began to undergo necrosis. So basically she had a patient who had blood flow issues. Kidney issues. Appendages that were visibly rotting. And who had basically no hope of coming out of the coma. And the family won't pull the plug. Basically the how the hell was he alive bit came from the fact that almost all of his bodily functions were taken care of via machines. And even then he's still barely functioning. But technically alive. This is about my great aunt who was in her late 90s at the time. She was in palliative care. Had a leg amputated due to circulation issues. Showed signs of severe dementia. All of her body's systems were failing. The doctor told us that it was just a matter of time. The woman's body had just stopped working. We went home and waited for the call. About noon the next day. We got a call asking if we could come and get her. She woke up. Demanded tea and toast. Ate it. And then started trying to bribe a nurse to get her a bottle of gin. W hen we got to the hospital. She was being wheeled around in a chair talking up a storm. No sign of dementia except that she thought it was 1940. The doctor just said she should be dead. Really she should be dead. That old woman will outlive me. Double quote. We had another month of her with us and then she passed quietly in her sleep. The doctors never could come up with a medical reason why she had that last month of clarity and relative health except to say that she just decided not to die that night. General surgeon here. Person came in with severe abdominal pain and found to have a perforated gastric ulcer. Upon exploration. Found what seemed to be a pound of carrots. Celery. And other undigested vegetable matter in their abdomen. Scooped it all out. Sewed up the stomach and put a patch on it. Then washed everything out real well. Another person with severe abdominal pain found to have a perforated stercoral ulcer. Basically found 5 pounds of rock hard poop everywhere and the entire colon was dead. Cut out the colon. Washed them out real good. And gave them an ileostomy. Person that weighed 500 pounds came in with a ruptured juxtarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Developed kidney failure and gluteal compartment syndrome. Needed fluids at 300 cchr. A Lasix drip. And CVVH a special type of dialysis. On day 2 they were complaining that they were hungry and we weren't feeding them. Obligatory not a doctor or in med school but pharmacy school. This guy had about 3x6 packs of beer. Felt from a 8 stories building and didn't die. Before he fell he was beaten up by his drinking buddies. Baseball bat to the back of the head. Oh before I forget. Two gunshots to the chest. I guess the most amazing thing to me was when they asked me to correct his electrolytes as he was being rolled into the IQ. To be fair pharmacists don't do much of other things but we maintain the nits and grits of things, like making sure the patient's electrolytes are okay so they won't have surgery complications and such. But all I thought to myself was, why bother? The guy's dead anyway. But guess what? Dude recovered and still alive. I can't even believe it myself. Neurologist here, high school boy upset about being dumped by his girlfriend gets spectacularly drunk with friends on a Friday night. He decides to finish the night by chugging an entire fifth of vodka. At which point his friends figure out that the situation might be serious. They do a stop, drop, and roll where they pull their car up to the ER. 
push him out. And drive away. He isn't breathing. And has to be put on a ventilator immediately. His blood alcohol level was over 400, and possibly still rising. And he is to all appearances, dead. I am called in to examine him. And he has absolutely no signs of brain function. No response to pain. Light. All reflexes gone. Eeg was even flatlined. It fulfilled the definition of brain death. Except that those criteria don't count if you are knocked out by drugs or alcohol. He did wake up in about 36 hours and was sent to a psych hospital. We had no idea how long he wasn't breathing. So it wasn't clear whether he was going to ever recover. That was a long 1-2 days for the parents. I'm PGY2. Just got done in the CCU last week. Had two patients with troponin 1 above the upper limit of VSA, 440. The only other one I had before this died. Anyway. One was a 40 year old guy who woke up diaphoretic with elbow pain. Wife drove him into the hospital and he clutched his chest. Called her name. And arrested 2 miles out from the hospital. They pull up in the ER. Find him pulseless. Start ACLS for somewhere between 30-60 minutes. Get ROSC. EKG shows street elevation V1-6. Emergent cath shows 100% lad. Gets stented. Transferred to his on an impeller, buried in his papillary muscle. Pulse pressure is like 3. So he's dependent on it completely bedside echo shows a hint of wiggle in his LV. Fast forward 2-3 days extubated. Awake. Talking, kind of. Off mechanical support and presses. Just goes to show that being young is your best bet for survival. TL. DR dude has a massive heart attack and goes without a pulse for 45 minutes. Heart sucks but his brain still works. Had two little girls in med school show up to the piku after their mom decided to drown them in the bathtub. Got cold feet. Called an ambulance. Got CPR for an hour. Still going as they are wheeled into the hospital. Got ROSC code iced. Walking and talking 5 days later. Still a little traumatized. Mom went to jail. I had an old super nice woman come in once in ventricular tachycardia, which is when your heart is in a wackadoodle super fast rhythm and can be fixed by shocking the heart. She was awake but adamantly refusing defibrillation or CPR but okay with getting medication. After 15 minutes or so, her head rolls back and she loses her pulse. I had pretty much told her son-in-law that this is it but we did give her one additional medication and continued to use a bag valve mask to give her some oxygen. This lasted 5 minutes and she miraculously spontaneously converted to a normal rhythm. 30 minutes later I went back to recheck her and she was surrounded by her children and grandchildren and happy as a clam. Could name every single one of them. I can't tell you how happy that made me that she was able to see her family again. My dad is a physician. He tells a story about being on call overnight and monitoring a patient with a severe cardiac condition. In the middle of the night the patient went into cardiac arrest and he pronounced him dead after they were unable to resuscitate him and he'd shown no vital signs for close to an hour. Later on that night he got a page indicating that there was a patient who had a bone to pick with him. He returned to the ward to find the deceased patient upright in bed. Alert and fully lucid. He was joking about the fact that he had been pronounced dead earlier that night. His return to health was remarkable. And possible only because his condition had involved the very gradual shunting of his pulmonary artery so that his body had slowly, over the course of months or years, become adapted to a low oxygen environment allowing it to survive approximately an hour without any cardiac function. A friend of mine is a 51 year guy. He pulled his car on a highway and exited the car to check his trailer. A van coming 100 km per hour was coming down the highway and watering the windshield and hit him at full speed. He flew between the car and the trailer. Fractured hip. Fractured shoulder blade. Fractured spine and the car also drove over his ankle smashing it completely. 8 months later he is full of metal and back to playing hockey. He said that if the car was anything smaller the van the people inside wouldn't have survived the tackle. I laughed at that joke. Not a doctor but we got a patient in ER who had received 8 gunshots to the torso. One in the head. And multiple to the arms and leg. 
It was a horrific case of her uncle deciding that if he couldn't have her then nobody would. Yeah. It was really effed up. No long term damage with the mental faculties and overall she recovered but it took months and multiple operations. Second big one was a marine who got ran over by a tank. It was the first time I placed an adult patient on high frequency oxalation. Basically. Instead of pressurized air being pushed into the lungs we used vibrations to move oxygen and CO2 in and out of the lungs. Third one was the guy whose wife tried to kill him by turning on a cement truck while he was in it cleaning it. Cement trucks have blades inside and is like a dryer. He had massive bands with hooks to hold his chest together and had to have his esophagus closed. I was working as a helicopter retrieval doctor in Australia last year. Called at 2 a.m. to a car crash in the middle of nowhere. Patient was 150 kilograms and 5 foot tall. So drunk he could smell the alcohol in her blood. Had been ejected from the front passenger seat of a car through the front windscreen. Wearing no seat belt. Had lain undiscovered for 3 hours on the side of the road. The temperature that night was 2 degrees centigrade. Her entire right scalp had been degloved. Blood pressure and oxygen saturation were unrecordable at all times on transfer due to shock. Hypothermia and body habitus. Carotid pulse only. GCS3, completely unconscious, due to her enormous obesity any movement of her head from the position she happened to land in obstructed her airway. If she had landed in any other position she would have had no way to breathe and died. 2 hours flight from nearest trauma center. Unable to intubate her without drugs due to muscle tone. Scariest RSI of my life. Drugs to paralyze then intubate, middle of a paddock. On ambulance stretcher. Under lights. Patient placed in ramp position. With best rewarming we could do in the helicopter core temperature was 29 centigrade on arrival in ED. We didn't carry blood on the helicopter at that time. Survived and discharged neurologically intact. When I was in pharmacy school I did a clinical rotation in a hospital with an infectious disease doctor. One of his IQ patients was in a coma. He had severe trauma from a motorcycle accident. My doc was just one of the many doctors following him, in our case it was because of sepsis from a perforated colon. Things were not going well. He'd been in a coma for two weeks and showed no signs of coming out of it. The team of doctors, and me. Sat with the family and discussed taking him off of life support. The family decided that it was the right decision. They said their goodbyes and I figured that was it. But the next day I came in and he was still on my patient list. I went to the IQ. And there he was. Alive and actually awake. Apparently he woke up that evening after I left. And he actually started to get better pretty quickly. Less than a week later he was out of IQ and in a regular room. And the next week he was no longer my patient because his sepsis had cleared and he no longer needed to be followed by the infections disease doctor. It was pretty damn amazing. Edit. Typos. Rookie firefighter. This was just a few months ago. I made my first medical call to a woman found unresponsive. This woman was a stage IV lymphoma patient who had 2 months to live. 6 months prior. When we got to her. She was on her bed with no pulse and cold. We found no DNR. And the family screamed for us to do everything we could. And paramedics en route told us to start CPR. We began compressions and rescue breathing and worked on this lady for 28 minutes and she finally had a pulse and began breathing on her own. I was thinking there was no way we could bring her back. But we did. Not a doctor. Happened to my brother when he was in his early 20s. Going over a snowy mountain pass and he is in the passenger seat. The driver goes into oncoming traffic and the side my brother was on hit an oncoming truck head on 80 miles per hour both cars. His seat belt was ripped out along with his whole seat of a car and even some of the car. I was 5 when this happened and no one really remember what happened because of the collision. He flew onto the guide rail of the cliff and slid his whole chest down it cutting into him with the seat still on his back. Then he flips at the edge of the cliff. Unconscious at this point and they speculate from the blood trails he slid down the mountain in the seat. He was airlifted to the best hospital in the state and remained in critical condition for 3 months. He now has several massive scars, several inches wide and about an inch deep, across his chest. 
arms and legs where he was cut open by the rails and doctors. The doctors said they never believed he would live. Not even one in a million. They said he should have died from 12 different things before he even got to the hospital. He is 37 now. Back in 75 we lived in the country and we had two wolves and several other dogs. One morning after my mother had taken the kids to the bus stop the male wolf got it into his head to attack me. I was on my back with this 95 pound wolf trying to rip out my throat. I'm fighting for all I'm worth. I'm prying his mouth off. I'm hitting him with my fist. My black lab broke her chain and came to the rescue and saved my life. My shirt was torn to shreds. I had puncture wounds in my throat. My fingers were torn. Had it not been for my lab, I'd have died. A week later dad took the wolf off and shot him. The lab was a rescue dog. Dad had found her on the side of the road and brought her home. Never knew who to thank. The bad guy for dumping that dog on the road. Or dad for saving her. Of course. I thanked the dog and she always got special treats. Obligatory not a doctor but. My great grandmother and grandfather both scared doctors. My great grandmother did so by having a blood pressure of 240 stroke 190 for 3 months straight including being on an no salt diet for 3 months minus 1 day of it until one day it just dropped back to normal. There was no damage to her body anywhere including with the blood vessels. My grandfather had polio when he was a kid, think between World War 1 and World War 2, and they thought he would die since it took out his ability to move anything below his lungs. He ended up being that bad and then it was as if polio decided to just retreat. It was gone within a couple of weeks and the only long term damage after everything was minimal. He just had his growth plates inactive for a while so he ended up fairly shorter than his dad and my dad. Anesthesiologist here. We had a fine young gentleman who was shot while diving away from a gang related bullet. A single bullet hit his right subclavian vein. Went through his right lung. Right diaphragm. Liver. Many loops of bowel. Hit both his left iliac artery and vein. And lodged in his sacrum. He coded. Heart stopped. No blood pressure. In the ED. Got an ED thoracotomy. Internal cardiac massage. And got his heart restarted. 200 plus units of blood products and 10 hours of emergent surgery later. He made it to the IQ. Before that night. I had never seen someone survive after an ED thoracotomy and had never given someone that much blood. He walked out of the fine hospital. When I was a paramedic student I was doing placement in my hometown which was a rural town of about 12k people. So there was a reasonably sized hospital. Around my former home there were a lot of smaller communities ranging from 2k down to a few hundred people. We get called first thing in the morning to the hospital to come pick up a guy who came in overnight and take him to the airport for transport via plane to Melbourne. He's basically up in the hills where there's nothing but winding roads. Wombats and kangaroos where he came off his motorcycle after attempting to dodge some of the local wildlife that clearly didn't give a fuck about looking both ways before crossing the road. He's given himself a good old skittle down the road. Picked himself up and dusted himself off and in true Aussie fashion decided. Bit fucked. Better go get someone to take a gander at this. Apostrophe. He self presented to the local police station in a small town of about one. 500 people to say. Yeah. Fucked up a bit. Need some help mate. At which point they've immediately called the ambos to come and collect him. It's a good 2 hour and change drive to the hospital where they x-ray him and discover a cervical spine, neck, fracture and refer him to the surgical unit in Melbourne. Not bad for a bloke that's broken his neck and decided fuck it. Better rock around to the cop shop to get this sorted out. Double quote. I'm the office manager technician secretary janitor accountant what have you, sole employee. Woohoo. Comma of an optometrist. Now. Optometry isn't crazy exciting. So this'll be pretty tame compared to the other stuff posted. Patient is a rather elderly Hispanic woman. Presents with complaints with her near visual acuity and slight headaches. I take her in the back to refract her and take her eye up. Weird. Can't get a reading for the ARK. So now comes the tonometer. Right eye. 27. Uh oh. Double check. 
24. Hum. I check the left eye. 49. 49. I double check it. 48. This lady's got full blown glaucoma. Doc gets her in the chair. Turns out she's got glaucoma from a leaking cataract in OS. And early diabetic retinopathy in both eyes. Her visual acuity is 20 stroke 400. This lady can't see shit. And then BSP. The kicker? She drove herself 24 miles to our office. Well. This story has happened somewhere around the 70s to my uncle and even made it to the newspaper. My uncle was driving on a scooter one afternoon on a country road when he was hit heavily by a car from the back. He fell of the scooter. Flew through the windshield of the car and came to an halt on the back seat. The driver of the car stepped on the brake so that he flew from the back seat again through the windshield and ended lying on the road. Except from some bruises he was unharmed. When the police came both. My uncle and the driver of the car told the same story, which they didn't believe in the first place. However my uncle had lost a shoe in the back of the car so finally also the police got convinced. My grandma cut out the article from the newspaper and it is still in a frame in her living room. Not so much a how are you alive but more of a how did you not know. Went in for a normal checkup to get my birth control renewed only to see my blood pressure was through the roof. Thought nothing of it. Found out my kidneys were functioning at 11%. The only symptom I had that I thought was weird was my legs itched really bad. High phosphorus causes itching. My legs would itch so bad they'd bleed. Saw a dermatologist several times they had nothing except maybe I was allergic to something. But I had no rash or anything. Turns out many other smaller things were issues. Feeling nauseous early in the morning. Migraine stuff like that. They kept asking me do you feel tired all the time? And weird weight gain. Water retention. And I was baffled. I thought maybe they were wrong. Two weeks later it hit my like a ton of bricks. Go to the point where I would be starving. Make myself some food take one bite and get nauseous. Lost 15 pounds before I went on dialysis and had problems with that. Kidneys were functioning at 1-2% before I was lucky enough to get my kidney transplant. Very hard to understand, and keep it together, going from normal functioning 24 year old to you need a transplant a sap. Not a doctor. But my sister's cardiologist has this story now. My family has had trouble holding on to health insurance for many years. But my sister's yearly heart checkups have been a priority, she was born with Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve. Which basically means blood leaks backwards and pumps oxygen very inefficiently. One year her appointment got postponed a few months due to a switch in providers and all that stupid shit. My sister was in 10th grade gym class and having trouble running every day. That's what she told us, I feel kinda sick after class which we thought would mean she got lightheaded. Turns out she was puking every class due to the exertion. My parents immediately decided that checking up on her heart would be the best decision and thank god they did. Her cardiologist said her heart was the size of a small watermelon and it was an absolute wonder she was only puking and not passing out or literally dropping dead if she was running a mile in less than 30 minutes, and I think her mile was under 15. He said it was one of the most advanced states of Epstein's he'd seen. If not the worst currently unoperated case in the country, US. Basically. She had to have an emergency open heart surgery, cone procedure and bidirectional glen at Boston Children's. And now. Four years later she's still on medication and is looking to get a pacemaker. Unbelievably. The arsehole gym teacher still gave her a B final grade. I did the medical rotation where my consultant was an endocrinologist. We had a young man with type 1 diabetes who would present almost weekly in diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, actually a medical emergency as can cause coma and death, from not taking his insulin and just eating whatever he wanted. Always self-discharged once he felt better. In my last week of the rotation. He came in after overdosing on IV opioids, found by his family after no one having any contact for about 24 hours. His temperature was 24 degrees Celsius in the ambulance and the pH of his blood was 6. 76. 7. 35-7. 45 is normal. Less than about 6. 
8 is not generally compatible with life. The paramedics, who all knew him, genuinely thought this was it for him. As did all the IQ. But as the old saying goes, you're not dead until you're warm and dead, and that at cold temperatures. Your metabolic rate can be slowed to the point where it appears you're deceased however on warming. Your body resumes more normal metabolic function. Warmed him up in the IQ. Treated his DKA and he survived. I rotated away to another hospital before he was discharged but he was out of IQ when I left, awake and interactive. Edit. To Claffy. 24 degrees Celsius. Normal is 36-37. 5. Paramedic here. I ran a call on a guy that was ejected out of a late 80s Mustang. The guy said the car rolled two times before pitching him out of the driver's side window. He said he landed on his head and the 7 inch scalp avulsion seemed to corroborate his story. The car was completely crushed and sitting on its top. The guy wanted to refuse treatment and transport. GCS 15 and never lost consciousness. I insisted though that he be seen at the ER. He rode the whole way texting people. When I told him that he shouldn't be alive he said yeah I got a hard nugget. Not a doctor, friend who's a crime scene tech. They apparently tell this story to police now to remind them that unless somebody is 100% utterly dead, like head 20 meters from body, call the ambulance. Police rock up to an address of a couple of druggies. Enter and it's a mess. Mattress at the center of the living room floor and blood everywhere. Cannot reach the mattress without stepping in it. Spray on the walls and ceiling. Two bodies on the mattress both covered in blood. Cops have to go round and enter through the back door just to get near them without fucking up the scene. Cops check. But no signs of life. Call detectives who arrive and start investigating the scene. About one hour into it and one of the bodies takes a deep breath and starts to move. For some reason no one decides to shoot what was obviously a zombie. Turns out they got high and decided to end it all. Only one didn't succeed and just had a really strong nap. And that's why police in my state can't issue life extinct certificates unless they are looking at a three year old skeleton. We have a patient we see at our hospital monthly. Young guy. Early 20s. Absolute turd to take care of. He has diabetes and essentially refuses to take his insulin. He comes in every time with diabetic ketoacidosis. Which is essentially your body going into a coma-like state due to your blood pH becoming acidotic and very elevated sugars. The impressive part isn't that he survives this. Most people do. It's that this is a recurring event every month and each time someone manages to find him get him to the hospital. If he was ever alone when this occurred and no one found him in a timely fashion. He'd be toast. Been seeing him regularly at the hospital for the last 18 months I've been here.